Thanks for coming. Welcome. Um, so representing predict so solu predictive solutions with PMML. And uh, you may, I, I think half of you probably never heard of PMML uh, from the people I've been talking to or just heard of about it now. But uh, you know, PMML is really the open standard to represent predictive analytics, uh, predictive models. So um, I wanted to make the talk fun. I mean, the, the chairs are very comfortable. So if I don't, you're probably going to sleep. I mean, it's not really a amazing. I mean, it's an XML language, so I can, you know, I'll try my hardest to make it an interesting topic. But, uh, you know, I try to imagine myself sitting in the chairs there. And uh, we have all these questions in mind. And these really are the questions that I'm going to try to answer today. So I'm going to start with uh, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, well, there's a need for a common language between predictor and injera, and I'm going to define the, those later. Um, and then PMML itself, what is PMML? Uh, what is PMML made of? Uh, who supports PMML? All things PMML, obviously. What are the benefits of using PMML? Uh, for how long has PMML been around? What is the new? What is new in the latest PMML version? Yes, there is more than one version out there. Um, PMML is great, but what's next for the standard? So what's coming up next? Are there any cool PMML tools I could use? Maybe. Uh, I love R. I actually talk to some people that love R just like me. So um, can you tell me specifics about PMML supporting R? Uh, what kind of workflows can I represent with PMML? And I mean workflows here, predictive workflows. So when you build a predictive solution, how do we represent it? And uh, finally, an example would be great. Obviously, I'll be talking about PML and not showing you the language. So I'm going to save you know, the best for, for last. Um, it's XML code. So uh, I hope uh, you know, you're not disappointed uh, when I show the example. Um, and then I'm going to give you a demo. And it's a live demo. So I'm hoping everything is going to work. So it's a little bit about, uh, about Zementis and myself uh, in our product so that you understand the demo as well. And uh, show them what you got. So let's get started. And this is the, really the problem that we're trying to solve here. I don't know if you've been involved in something like this before, but this is really how you deploy models in a traditional way. And I mean by deploying models is you build a predictive model on top of your historical data, and now you want to deploy this model. Well, usually the process is the scientist builds the model, and then it sends to the IT engineers to recode this model so that it works in production, right? Because you're not going to be running uh, your production, your desktop, in the scientist's desktop. So there will be a document. And you know, it's amazing what people do, uh, to, do uh, to deploy models. Uh, I've actually seen some uh, Word documents with all the weights of a neural net written on it. And uh, that's actually sent to the IT department. And sometimes the IT department is not even in this country, uh, actually most of the times. So you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings. There is an error in the documentation. There is an error in the coding. And it comes back and forth. And I know of a big company actually takes a year to deploy their models. Can you think of a year to deploy a predictive model? I mean, it's by the time you actually deploy this model, it's not worth, right? Because the data is new. The data has changed. The business has changed. You know, especially now, everything is so agile, right? We are so used to smartphones. Everything happens right away. And we want that for our predictive models as well, or predictive solutions. So you know, that's the problem we're trying to solve. What do we need, then, to solve this problem, right? Well, and this is, I'm trying to rephrase the problem here. We are basically lost in translation between these two words that I call predicta. And that's the word that is inhabited by data scientists. And injera, that's the word that's uh, inhabited by the IT engineers. And they talk very different languages. They don't talk the same language. So that's the problem here. The model requirements, when they go back and forth, they get lost in translation. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. How to deploy this model in a very fast and uh, uh, I'm actually missing the word. I, I got the word in Portuguese in my mind, but I cannot tell you that. Um, maybe Nuno will help. Uh. So what we need is a lingua franca. It's uh, actually something that is spoken by injera and predictor, right? So that there is no problem. I build a model, a predictive solution. I export it in PMML from my model building environment. 
And guess what? I just send that file to Njira. Njira loads it up in a scoring engine and it's ready to, to score new data. And it ha can happen in minutes, in seconds even. It can be automatic. So instead of a year to deploy a model, you can deploy it in minutes. I mean, that's really, I think, a revolution in terms of how you deploy your models. And that's really the power of open standards and that's what's, what PML is. So predictive model markup language, that's what it stands for. So it's XML based. It's not extremely exciting, but uh, you know, it allows you to represent all these predictive solutions in a language that can be understood. You open an XML file and you can understand. It's very verbose, of course, but it has all the tags and you're very familiar. If you're familiar with your neural nets, let's say your regression model or SVMs, you encounter the same kind of structures or elements inside PMML, your PMML file. And that's great for transparency too. And you know, it's a way for you to log your models. I know a lot of companies, they build their models in, I don't know, a, a software or even custom code using Python or Pro. I mean, who on earth can understand something that's generated by this after like a week, right? In PMML, this thing actually is representing a standard that can be understood by all because it's an open standard. Um, it's also a very mature standard. I mean, it has been around for a while, and I will show you a slide about that. It's developed by the Data Mining Group. The Data Mining Group is really a consortium of companies that came together many, many years ago and started developing the standard from ground zero. And we are in version 4.1 now. It's a very mature and refined version. So we're really trying to, you know, uh, avoid proprietary issues and incompatibilities between systems. So it, let's say you can build a model in R and deploy it in the Zamensi scoring engine, and there is no incompatibilities between the two systems. They just talk the same language. So eliminates the need for custom model deployment. So you don't need to write a document anymore. You just export your model or a solution as PMML, and you have it ready to be used. Um, one of the myths of PMML is that it only represents the predictive model, nothing else. And that's really a myth that doesn't work. You know, it's, it's a wrong myth. Uh, you can also represent data transformations in PMML in quite a bit of them for pre-processing and post-processing. So nowadays in PMML, you can actually even do thresholds and business decisions. So the language really grew to in, you know, encapsulate all the pre-processing that's needed for uh, predictive solution as well as the post-processing. And that's why I like the yin and yang sign there because it combines these two very different things, right? You think of data pre-processing and model kind of in a different way. Components. It's a very structured language. Um, there are components for everything and it kind of relates to a predictive task. So if you're familiar with your model building skills, obviously you're going to relate to that. Uh, there is a I can see like PMML on top, it's a tag for an XML, the XML file. And then you have a header. It's basically a version, a timestamp, and uh, it has copyright information, things of that nature. And then you have a data dictionary, and that's really where you define the inputs to your model. So that's where you have all the raw data. And the raw data is basically uh, categorical variables, continuous variables, and things like that. And you can actually define which values are valid and invalid and you can define outliers and all of that in the data dictionary. And then you have data transformations. Uh, you can define a host of pre-processing, arithmetic, text manipulation, and, uh, and logical manipulation. You, can even, you even have an if-then-else function in PMML, so it can really be generic here. You don't need to follow an element that is there already. You can just implement anything in PMML. And then you have the model. The model can be a neural network, support vector machine, uh, association rules, uh, regression models, general regression models, generalized linear regression models. Um, I would say the 95% of the predictive algorithms that are used by companies today are represented in PMML. There is always that 5% that you know, people use innovative algorithms that are not in the standard. So it's a co comprehensive list of data mining models and uh, you know, there is power and flexibility in PMML to represent those. And uh, you know, I've been very creative with PMML. There are some elements that, there is a host of elements and there is all these other things that are not 
to represent any PMML. And I had a client that wanted to uh, represent a scorecard in PMML. And this was an older version of PMML. Now it has actually scorecards. And uh, I just put it together. You know, I used all these PMML elements and I was able to represent uh, a scorecard. Uh, we also were able to represent uh, neural gas models, you know, by using the neural network element, which was originally uh, used for feed-forward uh, uh, neural networks. So you can, you know, manipulate these elements in a way to represent a lot of other uh, predictive algorithms. One that I like a lot is restricted Boltzmann machine. It's not an element in PMML, but you can easily represent it using generic elements. And uh, you know, it contains outputs. You can output probabilities. You can output uh, confidence levels and besides our predictive value. So uh, there is a lot of uh, elements for model explanation. So you can have a PML file and it has your performance, the performance of your predictive solution in there as well. You may not use that to score your model, but you, you want to maybe have that whenever you open the file, you know, oh, this model had this performance when it was built two years ago, right? And now I'm getting a different performance. Oops, maybe it's time to retrain. Mm. Industry support. Um, oh, it's still coming up. <laughs> um, I may, I don't think this list is uh, complete, uh, but I was, when preparing the slides, I was just putting, you know, some of the supporters that have tools uh, that uh, consume or produce PMML in, to a certain degree. Um, so, it, yeah, as you can see, a lot of the companies out there are supporting PML. And I just talk, was talking to someone about Google. Google has this prediction API out there, right? And they, they have support for PML preprocessing. So I don't know where that is going to go, but I forgot that in the list. If you don't see your company there, just act and uh, get into the Venn wagon because everybody's doing it. Uh, benefits, and I think I mentioned a little bit of this be, uh, before, it's really um, something that you can use across the company, you know, if all the people that are interested in the predictive process that you have in your company, right? So it can be across applications, across divisions, across service providers, and if you uh, want to actually another company to build a model for you, you just say, okay, here's the model I want you to build, but I want a PML file back because then really you can understand and you can see what they have actually come up with, right? Um, Ensures transparency, although you can, you know, encrypt it, obviously. Um, disseminates knowledge, uh, best practices. I worked before in a large team of data scientists and really uh, every time uh, someone went to another team in the company and you inherited all the, uh, you know, the projects for that person, I had to go to all the directories and search for things and open files and try to understand. If all that was representing PMML, it would be very easy. It would just open and say, oh, okay, this is what the person meant, right? So it really disseminates knowledge and ensures best practices. Um, and transforms predictive models into dynamic assets. They're not something that you're going to put to use a year from now. You can put it to use at the moment that you created it. So. I can see no one is sleeping yet, so I'm very happy. <laughs> uh, release history. As I told you, it's mature and refined. It's actually 15 years old. Um, wow. So the ver first version was 0 0.7 uh, in July 1997. We came long ways all the way to December last year with the release of PML 4.1. So I didn't tell, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually the representative for Zementis in the data mining group. So I'm part of the committee that defines the standard. And I was just telling Greg before, it's kind of a battle because for any proposal to get accepted and be part of the standard, it needs to be approved by all the members. So it's 100%. And uh, you know, sometimes I really get tired of that. It's like too democratic. Like, can I just push this in? I know it's good, but uh, it's not the way it works. So, it takes a while. You can see that you know every t you have a release every two years, let's say, because you know that's the way the committee uh, works. But you know at the end you really have a product that can be used by all and is understood by all, and everybody's happy. So version 4.0. What was different in this last version? Um, well, it was released uh, just a few months ago. There are some new model elements, like I mentioned before, scorecards is one of them, and you know. 
I actually, uh, my undergrad, I was, I did my uh, undergrad thesis in neural networks, and this was like 20 something years ago. So uh, when I learned about scorecards, and I think, for example, FICO uses scorecards and Equifax and all these uh, 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 bureaus use scorecards quite a bit, and it's using financial institutions quite a bit. I was really surprised, right, because it's really a representation of regression models, but in a way that you can understand and explain. And that makes a lot of sense in these industries. So PML was lacking that, and so we actually teamed up with FICO uh, to introduce scorecards into, we wrote a proposal together, and now it's part of the standard. We actually wrote a paper for KDD last year that describes the element as well. So if you're interested in that, just let me know. Uh, it also has an element for KNIST neighbors now, which is a little hard because, as you know, Kenya's names are like a lazy learner, so you have to have the entire data inside a PML file. So it has, you know, it's not um, uh, a really simple element to implement, and that's why it took a long time to be part of the standard, right? Because it had to mature to be able to introduce that. Uh, baseline model is another one. And then PML 4.0, which was the version before 4.1, um, had, um, the capability of you represent several predictive models inside a single PMML file. And that's a multiple model kind of situation, right? But it was kind of cumbersome. It was very complicated. So in what, what happened in PML 4.1, that was kind of re-engineered, and now it's a much simpler uh, element to represent uh, model ensembles. You can represent a lot of things uh, with a single element in PML, and I think it really, really works great. I've been using it quite a bit. Um, we have post-processing, so now we have business decisions inside uh, the output element. So you can say, well, sure, uh, for example, if you build a model to um, detect the risk of churn for your clients, you can then set a threshold for a different threshold levels for different buckets. So you want to say, okay, well, this guy is really going to churn next week, so I want to send him a very nice gift. I'll send him to the Hawaii for a week, you know, for okay. based on whatever, my predictive model. That would be a nice predictive model. But. And then this guy is not going to churn at all. Nah, I'm not going to do anything for him. But you can do that, and you can put those decisions inside PML, or not. It's up really to you. Uh, it's optional. Uh, there is more built-in functions. Uh, These built-in functions allow you to do a lot of pre-processing or data transformations inside PML. So there is more of those. and. Uh, you know, there's more generic output fields as well for affinity and IDs and things of that nature. What's coming up next? Well, we're already working on PML 4.2, which is the next version. And uh, this is kind of a sneak peek. And there's a proposal we have that's going through the committee. It's getting all these earmarks now, so it's going to take a while to pass through it. But the idea is to have uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, PML file that you can reference external PMML files. So in a multiple model situation, you can have an umbrella model that calls different models inside that umbrella model, which can be in terms of, let's say, a model segmentation kind of scenario. And the idea is that it would make it easier to test these models once you go into production, right? Because you don't need them to, if you have to change one model, you just take that model out and you put a new one in. You don't need to change all the entire PMML configuration for that. You continue with your umbrella, the same umbrella model and all the other elements, you're just replacing one. Because as of today, you have a single PMML file for everything, right? So if, even if we train just one model inside that multiple model element, you have to deploy an entire thing, okay? Although in our scoring engine, you can actually already do it. Uh, the way we do is, you know, based, based on uh, our client's requirements, we introduce things, uh, things into our engine, and then they, we try to make a proposal for the standard itself. So that's how we do internally at Cementus. And the nice thing also, you can do the decoupling of uh, pre-processing and post-processing. You don't need to have all the pre-processing inside a single file with your predictive model. You can have them in different PMML files. I think that makes it simpler as well. And one thing that's interesting, you can actually do uh, pre-processing in PML and do all your pre-processing in PML. Until now, uh, PML has been using, used only for the deployment of models. But it's an interesting use case, I think, to use PML for building models, right? 
you can actually present all your pre-processing in PMML, you know, pass your data through your pre-processing and extract the features you want and then build your model outside and then deploy that model. And then guess what? All your pre-processing is already written down in PMML. So you don't need to redo that again. Yes? Uh, a model would be a neural network or a support vector machine or a regression um, association rules, a different kind of model. Uh, a nearest neighbor model, a scorecard. Business applications, for, for example, fraud detection. For fraud detection, you may have a neural network that uh, you know, learns the difference between uh, you know, crooks and non in people that normal people that are doing their transactions. And so, you know, that's a model. You're going to train that model with data from normal transactions and transactions that are actually fraudulent. And then the model will have to differentiate between the two, right? And then it's going to, you're going to deploy that model. So let's say you use PMML to represent that model. You're going to move into production. And now that model is going to look at every single transaction that's coming through in the pipeline and do uh, output a risk for that transaction to be fraud. And depending on that risk, and that's what a lot of the banks do today, they will actually decline the transaction in real time. So it's the predictive model that actually is telling uh, the bank not to accept that transaction. Okay, so that's, that's a real application that, you know, I'm sure you encountered. I had transactions denied before and I was mad. Yes. What is not a predictive model? Okay, so analytics is, you have descriptive analytics, right? And you have predictive analytics. In descriptive analytics, like your business intelligence kind of scenario in which you wanna know how many people churned in the last week, um, how much money you uh, lost because of fraud in the last three months. What was the average transaction, uh, you know, in the last 24 hours, right? So you're looking back in the past and you're capturing all those and you're creating dashboards so that the business folks can actually make decisions on top of that, okay? Now predictive analytics actually tr tries to look forward. So you're looking uh, to build these models on data, on historical data that you have, and then you're gonna use these models on new data hoping that you know, the patterns that you identified that these predictive models learned on the historical data will be repeated in the new data so you can tell things apart. And that's how you know, a predictive model can tell if a transaction is fraudulent, even though it never saw that transaction before. But it saw something similar to that. The patterns were similar. Well, it, it, it could be, right? There is a class of uh, predictive models, per se, that are called association rules. And those are the things we see in like mar market basket analysis, you know, like people that buy, and that's a very famous example, beer and diapers also buy, I'm sorry, what's the other one? Milk, or yeah, exactly. So these are association rules that are also representing PMML, but you're doing associations, yes. I think it could, you know, it's, it's, it's up to, to you to define the use case and use it. Like I said, you know, it's coming to be, I think, a generic language, so to speak. Um, so you can... Like clustering and things, that wouldn't necessarily be predictive. That's very true. And we, we have that in, in, uh, in PMR, you can do hierarchical clustering or, or you know, k-means and all that, so, thanks. There are so many models that kind of get confused, but it's, it's true. Yes. Correct. The ATL is not part of, of PML. It's what brings the data into the PML file per se, to the to the model, to the predictive solution, right? So yeah, but imagine, I mean, this is an open standard. You're not trying to and if, if you come to that, it's a configuration basis that is really uh, very um, particular to each company and how they assemble the data together. So, um, yeah, no, it, it, it doesn't try to, to cover, you know, how you're going to pull your data and uh, how you're going to connect. 
I see. You know, I heard of something before, um, because I, I actually gave a, a, the, a similar talk to the R group here in the Bay Area. And someone came to me later and talk, told me about a standard that's also an XML standard, and I think it's used for that. But I don't remember the name, so I'll have to get back to you. I mean, you can send me an email. Um, and he's, he directed me to a website, and I looked at it, but this was like, I think, two years ago. So, OK. Um, so here we're getting to the tools. Are, are there any cool tools about it? Well, I don't know if uh, you know, they are cool. I don't, you know, I think they're useful. Um, the PML converter, I think, is an extremely useful tool. Like, uh, I mean, you saw all those different versions of PML, right? And so we have, uh, for example, SAS. SAS outputs, uh, if you build a model in SAS, you can export it as a PML file, but I think it's a version Depending on the version of SAS Enterprise Miner you have, you may export SAS uh, PML 3.1. If you have the latest, I think it exports PML 4.0, right? But I mean, how do you combine all these different versions, right? So um, that's why you need a PML converter. So you can feed any version into it and then get the latest out. And that's what we did uh, at Semantis. We com came up with the idea of having a universal PML converter that can take in PML files from all these different vendors in all kinds of versions and just spit out standard latest version PML. So we try to make it as universal as it should be, right? So it, it, it validates a PML file, but it, uh, and it converts, obviously it's a converter, but it also corrects PML. So what we found out is that, uh, you know, it's verbose, uh, big companies, uh, tend to have different things implemented in the export of PMML for decision trees. Another thing implements PML export for neural nets, and they're in the different parts of the world. And you would think that the same company would have a very similar PML export, and they don't. They make little mistakes, you know, one team does one kind of mistake, another team does another kind of mistake. So what we did, we worked with all these vendors to get PML models from all of them, all these different kinds. And we looked for them and we created uh, correctors. So it automatically corrects. So for the user, it's transparent. So it just uploads, even if it has an imperfection, and it corrects it. Oh, yeah, well. This converter is part of, I mean, it's available on our website and you can use, but yeah, we always uh, export the latest. And it's, it's part of our scoring engine, so as part of our scoring engine, because the scoring engine always then takes the latest, right? It's not setting time. And uh, go ahead. That's also an, a good reason to do that, yes. Um, and by the way, we do not convert for one yet. That's going to be in two weeks from now. So we're really working hard in trying to support that. Right now, if you go to the website and try to convert, you're going to get a 4.0 file back. But uh, we've been working for the last four months in getting it to actually take 4.1 files and export 4.1 files as well. Uh, the other two I, I think is very interesting. We had an intern that came into Zementis and I actually was supervising and I said, well, I think it would be great to have a transformation generator. And I wrote all this bunch of requirements and he came up with the transformation generator. And, you know, it has some clunkiness in it. I think the interface could be improved, but it's a great tool. I use it almost every day, you know. You can represent all your data transformations using this transformation generator. I'm going to say all, but most of them. So it has all the, uh, let's say, basic PML elements for data transformation. You can do continuous normalization. You can do uh, discretizations, mappings. And there is this thing called generic operation in which you can do if then else, and you can do nested if then else with arithmetic and logic operators and uh, you know, all kinds of things that you can think of. And it's extremely powerful because you do that graphically and you just click on you know create pmml at the bottom and it creates your pmml for you so i wouldn't say uh, because what you're trying to do here is you grab your raw data from your database or i don't know a pipeline or anything that's coming in right and what you want to represent in your predictive solution is actually the manipulation of this raw data are you combining fields are you you know 
uh, doing some mashup in there or creating some, looking at some table that will be mapping, you know, this category to some number that is important to you. And that's really not, I think, a job of, it's like a transformation part of an ETL, but that is part of PML. So if you think of ETL as transformations, I would say this is the transformation part. So yeah, I, yeah, thanks. Kind of clarifies. When I think of ETL, I just think of the, you know, looking at where your data is, but this is really the transformation part. Yes. It's not the E, it's the T, correct. Uh, well, for the R lovers in there, um, support for uh, PML in R. So it's growing, right? It's community driven, uh, as you know. Um, you can export all kinds of models in, in R these days. You can even export random forest models. So imagine uh, you know, building a random forest model, let's say 500 trees, and trying to write this in a document and send it to your IT team you know, somewhere else. It's maddening, right? But if you can represent that in PML and just you know, import that into a scoring engine and you, you're good to go, that's, that's great. That's what you want to do. So um, we wrote a paper in the R journal like in 2009. It kind of has an introduction to it. This was the state, the state of the art in 2009. That's what's represented in the paper. But it's a really nice introduction to the PML package. So I got involved with that, uh, the group that was doing that. Um, it's maintained by a gentleman in uh, Australia. He's actually the head of the, the data scientist, the head data scientist of the tax office in Australia. And he has his own company, and he has a GUI for R, and he created the PML package as part of that GUI. And this was many years ago, so it kind of evolved quite a bit uh, since then. Yes. I, I think he's uh, saying, how do I compare this package with the Java PML package? Well, this is package is specific to R. So you, if you're using R to build your models or do any pre-processing, you would then have to use this package to get your PML out of your model. So let's say you use uh, KSVM, which is a package in R to build uh, support vector machines. And then um, what R is going to do is represent your support vector machine as an internal object. Okay? And you can print that object. Uh, you have to represent it that way if you want to take it outside. But you can actually use the PML package to give that object, object to the package and get a PML representation of it out, you know, from that object. So this is really in the R world. It's not anything that's out there. Java does not have a, a function for training neural networks, right? Um, so, or decision trees or anything like that. R does. Um, and R is an example. R, I think, is, I don't know if you heard of SPSS modeler or statistics. That's what R is, you know. It's also a tool to do, you know, data analysis and statistics on top of your data. And I'm, I'm planning to show also NIME in the demo. NIME is a tool from Germany. Uh, it's free. You can download it, just like R. That's why I like talking about R, because it's, it's open, you know. So you can get it anytime, and it's installed and get PML out of it. Oh, it's called K-N-I-M-E, NIME, yeah, that's the company. And there's another company in Germany as well. I don't know what Germans with these companies, you know, that uh, uh, do great things. Like Rap Rapid Miner is another uh, example of uh, a system that uh, is free, is out there, and you can use to create models. So, you know, there are three great uh, packages that you can use to build your predictive models or solutions are NIME or Rapid Miner, you know, I used all the the three of them, and, you know, they're free, so, <laughs> and they were great, uh, very user-friendly. I, I will show you one, so if you stay here until the end, you, I will see it. So predictive workflows. So if, if you're not really familiar with predictive solutions, that maybe will give you a better idea. So a predictive solution has all these different elements in there, right? You have this data extraction, data stream coming in, right, your raw data. And then you have some input validation. You're going to see, well, what is an outlier here? What are the missing values? Are there any invalid values? And this really happens in the real world. You know, you really have to be careful where you're going to deploy your model because invalid values are going to be coming in. You know, someone is going to screw something up and then all of a sudden your model is going to be getting all these invalid values and going to generate really weird scores at the end or, or risks if you don't account for that. 
And I've seen that firsthand in a job I had before, you know, that this model was just everywhere. And then at that time, it took us three months to figure out what was the input data, but this was more than 10 years ago. So things have changed quite a bit, but it's still, I mean, if you don't account for it, you're going to get results that are not really predictive. They're screwy. So. Um, Data preprocessing, and that's really when you get your raw data, now you start combining it, you, get, you start getting your features out of the data. And features are extremely important here because you really want the models to concentrate on what is important in the data. You're just really helping the models, right? If you give raw data to the model and you know, hope that it will learn, it may not. But if you extract the features, it makes a complete difference. So, and you know, people say, uh, and I actually believe that as a data scientist, the most important task is actually figuring out the features that work for you. You know, you spend a lot of time mining for those features, and then you build the model out of that. But the model, I would say, is the, the you know the actually the easy part. Uh, and then the data, do you have the predictive model? That means, let's say, if it's a neural network, decision tree, the trees themselves, the nodes, and that's the structure of your model. Uh, and then the data post-processing. Usually, when you think of post-processing or predictive models, you think of scaling. Uh, a neural network would generate a value between minus one and one. If you give that to your, you know, as a result, no one is going to understand, right? So we actually got used to scores, you know, uh, between zero and a thousand. So, you know, the FICO score, everybody has a FICO score here, right? And you relate to that, oh yeah, my score is 740. What if you would have to say, my score is 0 0.471? You know, it's not the same. So it's kind of a marketing strategy, but that's what scaling does. What scaling does, too, is it allows you to do the same kind of performance that your old model did so that the things that survive on your model, let's say if you have to retrain your model, put a new model in tomorrow, you want that new model to have the similar performance as the old model. So you do the scaling on this new model so that it, it actually behaves like the old model did. So it doesn't disturb your operations that much. So when I think of post-processing, I always think of scaling, but now if PMO can do business decisions, like I said, you know, send people to the Bahamas or to Hawaii, whatever you want to do. Yes. Yeah, the, the param I hope I understood. Yeah, the parameters and stuff are in the predictive model in that box, yeah, and I, I will show you that when I show the example. No, the parameters are part of your model, right? You, you train the model a priori, right? So yeah, you, you, you have your desktop, you have R or NIME, and you train your model. With all this raw data, you did all the feature selection, and you build your model, now you have all these parameters. And when you write the PML file, you write all that down into the file. Yeah, that's, that's why you look for outliers, right? And I think, yeah, Actually, go ahead. We can, we can implement outliers ourselves, but is there, a, is there a package out there similar to how R was built for predictive modeling? Is there a package out there which is actually built for data cleanup and making sure you, know, you apply that and it will tell you whatever you need to know about the variations in data, about the outliers? I think you can get to that, uh, but that's why data scientists are in high demand. Uh, because they they will figure those things out. You know, there is not, I think, an automatic or a, a magic package that will do that. There is a yeah. I'll get to you. No, go ahead. Okay. Go go for it. You know, there are systems that are kind of black boxy, and I'm I have problems with them. I mean, maybe they're great systems. Don't get me wrong, but they just say advertise, give us all your raw data, and we'll figure everything out for you. And I I don't know. I'm always like, yeah, really, because. I've been in scenarios like that in which people did that and the end result was, you know, a predictive model that was overfeeding or something like that that was not something you could actually use at the end. So, I don't know. Yeah, but you know, like there's this ruling, uh, for example, for outliers, if it's over six standard deviations of your data, just cut it off. So, okay, so, um, Multiple models, right? I told you you can represent all these things inside a PML file, so model segmentation. You can have, you have this predicate-based model selections. For, for example, if your clients live in California, you want to execute the California model. Uh, if this is a new account, you maybe you want to build a model just for new accounts. So you can have that predicate-based saying, oh, is this, how old is this, uh, you know, this account? 
oh, it's just one month old. Okay, then I'm gonna pass through my new models account, new accounts model. So you know you can do that model segmentation uh, representation in PML. That's for the deployment part. Model ensemble, and I'm sure you are all very familiar with Netflix Prize. At the end, the winner was a model ensemble, right? It was like all these models combined together. And uh, that's what you can have also in PML. You have several models that will be scored at the same time or represented at the same time into a PML file. Random forest is a great example of modern ensemble. You have 500 trees, they're all gonna be scored at the end, you're gonna have majority vote or probability based. Okay, so you can do that as well. Uh, model chaining, and uh, in here you can use a model uh, to actually derive some values for another model. So we're actually using a model for pre-processing for the other models that are gonna come down the chain, right? So that's also an approach that you can represent very easily in PML. The other one, model composition, you can actually use something like um, a predicate-based model selection. So you have the main model, it can be a decision tree in which the nodes of the, the, the tree uh, allow you to then uh, uh, fire your predicates to, you know, execute different models or call different models. So it can be very complex. That's, I think, the idea here. So the multiple models element can, you can be used to represent all that. Final example, and uh, it's an earth-shattering uh, example. Uh, but I, I thought, you know, since this is a data scientist kind of, uh, you know, community that you would be familiar with this example. But, uh, you know, it's, it was an example that uh, uh, Duda and Hart used in their famous book called, I think, Pattern Recognition. It's a classic in, in, uh, in predictive analytics. And I, you know, I think that's one example that stuck to my head because I said, oh, wow, this is a great example to use, but it's not very practical. So I'm sorry, you have to kind of generalize it to, you know, we can talk about applications uh, if you want. So the idea here is that there is fish coming through a, you know, a trail, right? An automatic tray. And uh, there is a CCD camera that's taking pictures of this fish. And the goal here is to be able to um, separate the salmon from the sea bass. So you have two buckets at the end, one will contain salmon, salmon the other one uh, sea bass, and you want to automate that. Well, how would you do that, right? Uh, use predictive analytics. Let's create, create a predictive solution for that. So uh, you can have, um, and this is you know, part of the book as well, they found out two features. So it's not the raw data here, right? The length of the fish is a feature, right? You're extracting something from the raw data or the intensity of the scales is also features. So someone had to think about it and create these features. They're very interesting ones. Um, and then you pass for a predictive model, build your model out of those features. So you have features, so you have thousands and thousands of fish coming through, that's your historical data, and you already know which one is salmon and sea bass, and you train, let's say, your neural network, and you get a predictive model out of it. And now, let's say you want some business rules. You wanna say, well, the probability for salmon needs to be greater than 0.8 for me to classify a salmon. If it's lower than that, it's gonna go to the sea bass bucket because I wanna make sure that once I sell this salmon, I'm not selling sea bass. People would be really mad if I did. So something like that. So here's the PML, <laughs> the XML file. So I tried to blow it up a little bit. Yeah, you can actually read. Um, so there is a header over there. This is version 4.1, it's the latest version. Uh, there is a schema location, that's uh, the DMG website there. And then you have the copyright in the rather, a timestamp. So this is a description, the neural network for classifying fish. Uh, you know, very useful. Um, and a data dictionary, and remember I told you the dictionaries will actually define the raw data fields. Uh, in here, though, I, I'm having the, you know, it's too complicated to define the raw data fields for this. So I just put fish length and intents of scales. And you can see that I have for the fish length, length an interval uh, which defines, you know, more or less where the fish should be uh, from zero to 20. If it's over 20, I would say it's invalid. I will treat invalid in different ways and I can do that in PMML. Um, and then I have a mining schema and that's where the first element on the mining field there, the fish length, I'm gonna treat outliers are extreme values. So if the value is between, uh, it's greater than 14, you see that on the bottom there are low value and high, high value. If the fish length is greater than 14, I'm actually have it equal to 14. So I'm gonna be treating outliers like that as extreme values. Uh, and then I'm gonna uh, have an invalid value treatment. So if there is an invalid value coming through, 
I'm actually going to return an invalid out. I'm going to say, okay, well, there is a problem here. I'm not going to score this record or this fish. Um, and then if there are any missing values, I decided to replace them with the mean. It's just an alternative. You can use mode or anything you want like that. So if there is a missing value for fish length, I'm just going to, ah, it's seven. That's how I want my model to behave, and I'm going to create a safe environment for my model. Um, you can see there in the output element, I'm having a f the fish class. I want to know if it's salmon or sea bass. Uh, fraud or non-fraud. Churn is not going to churn. You know, so many applications. Healthcare, is this person going to have a heart attack or not? Think of your own scenario here. Um, and the probability of salmon, the probability of sea bass. And then I'm having this business decision here, and I look for, I actually create a threshold of 0 0.8. And if the probability of someone is lower than 0 0.8, I'm going to assign it to the CBAS bucket. Okay, so that's what, it, that's all represented in the PML file there. And then the transformations, what I'm going to do is actually normalize these continuous variables so that my neural network will get some nice normalized inputs, right? If you build neural networks, you always have to normalize the input before you do that. And here's the neural network itself. So the parameters that you trained and all that, that's represented here. So you have uh, all your neural net weights in there. And, you know, so you can open and see all that. If you have decision trees, you have a decision tree. If you have a spot vector machine, your spot vector machine will be there. Um, that's where it's represented. I know you're like, wow. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> it depends on... Right, it depends on the model you're using, right? For neural nets, you're going to have to um, map your categorical variables into numerical variables to fit into the neural net, so you can, you can do that. Oh, yeah, yes. Right, right. Exactly, yeah, there are elements to do those mappings, yes, yes. So I'm getting now to the demo part, and I hope it's, uh, you know, something you enjoy. It's live, so, you know, we'll see. Yes. Well, PMML is an open standard, right? So um, once you represent that model in PMML, you're really joining a community of other vendors and users that are using the same standard to represent that. And that's a workflow I would go for PMML because it's something that you can open later on and you understand now you're going to open C code a week from now, you're not going to know what's there, right? What I see also, and I think it relates to your question, is that companies are very... I mean, everybody's hiring data scientists these days. I mean, it's amazing, right? But then you, mu you love SAS. I'm not saying you, but you love SAS. I love R, and uh, you know, someone else loves NIME, and that's where they feel comfortable you know, working with. But if you're your company and you say, no, I'm just gonna have SAS in-house, you're gonna have to really narrow your, you know, your pool of applicants to people that know SAS. And it's a skill that's very hard to, to learn. Obviously, people you know, take learn to be SaaS ex years to be SaaS experts as, as well as our experts. So, you know, if you're a company out there, you really want to hire your data scientists and keep them doing what they do best. So, if they're representing R or SaaS, SPSS or NIME or you know any other tool, they can then represent all their solutions in PML, and that's the common ground between data scientists as well—not just Predict and Injira, but inside Predict itself. So I think that's I spin your question. I know it's a different than, yes. Right, yes, uh, for Mars and for all the other ones, yes. And they are in San Diego too, so that's like actually a few blocks away. Okay, yeah, that's, that's I think what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show an alternative, which is the software we build, but, okay. So about us, I mean, I mean, who am I, right? Well, I'm <laughs> I work for Zementis. I've been with Zementis since uh, the first month of inception that was almost eight years ago, so I'm getting old on my job, but uh, I love what I do, so that's what counts, and, and PML is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we are really devoted to predictive analytics. Um, we were founded in 2004. We are offices in San Diego and Hong Kong. Uh, we are really solving the IT deployment integration challenge, um, so deploying models make it very simple in different platforms, and you see here, there on top, we have uh, solutions on the cloud, so if you want to execute your models in real time on the Amazon cloud, and we have clients all over the world because of that. Uh, there are data centers all over the world these days, right? So um, what I found in, uh, for the cloud option, 
There is a lot of companies in uh, emerging economies that are benefiting from that because the starting price of post solution on the Amazon cloud, for example, is one dollar an hour. SaaS will never beat that, you know. So it's 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 that kind of it's software as a service. It's very simple. They just launch an instance on the clouds and they can use their peer, their, their predictive solutions right away uh, via web services. So every time you deploy your model on the cloud, it's available as a web service and you just code against the web service. Um, so being a member of the DMG, obviously for many years now, uh, we have an extensive uh, partner network. So we have solutions with, uh, and I'm going to be showing you that Datamir is a company actually here in the Bay Area. They do a solution. It's a spreadsheet like on top of Hadoop to do data analysis and all that. I'm going to show you a little bit of that. So you can now use, uh, deploy your predictive models in, inside Datamir and use it on top of Hadoop. Um, we have uh, in-database solutions, so you can also score your models inside a database. We are partnered with EMC Greenplan, uh, Sybase IQ, and the IBM Netiza database, and we are talking to all the other database makers as well to make the scoring engine for PML available in all these different um, options, flavors. Um, and then we have uh, of, of the other partners, uh, Revolution, which is in the area as well. It's an R uh, commercial branch, commercial branch of R. And uh, we partnered with IBM as well to have our solution available on the IBM Smart Cloud. And it, you know, with IBM, it works really well because SPSS, if you use any of the SPSS products, you can export almost all the models into PMML. And it's very complete. And even SPSS statistics, which is not, you know, when you think of building models, you think of Modeler or Clementine, how we used to know it. But the statistics has uh, you know, a possibility for people to create their feature detects automatically. There are a lot of companies that are offering that. So you don't need to be extremely creative. You can click a button, you, you, know, you create all kinds of feature detects, evaluate them for you. And in statistics, you can actually export those as a PML file. And then they have a tool inside the statistics that allows you to combine the pre-processing with the model itself. So then you get a single PML file for the entire solution. So. Um, so we have two product lines here, um, and so we have in the model building part, and I'm going to show you a little bit, I'm going to try to build a model in R, and I hope I succeed, and then uh, I'm going to deploy that in PMML, and uh, it's exported as a PMML file, and then I'm going to upload uh, to the Amazon Cloud, uh, which is running ADAPA, which is our scoring engine, it's called ADAPA, it stands for Adaptive Decision Predictive Analytics, and uh, it's also, and that's the reason we chose the name, it's also the Babylonian god of wisdom. So it's kind of, yeah. Um, and we re really use ADAPA for real-time scoring. If you have lots of data that you need to execute in real-time, that's the engine you have to use. Uh, and then we have another product called Universal PML Plugin, a UP. And that's the in-database one and the Hadoop one. So that's the two kind of flavors of the scoring engine. Um, I think I talked about Adapa before, so you know, just to know, to let you know, Amazon Cloud uh, is everywhere. You know, we have clients in India, in Brazil, using the cloud, you know, 24/7, and it's very convenient for them. And you can also have it on site. So um, we have a lot of clients that are financial companies that do not want to send their data to the cloud or anything like that, so they keep it in house. They buy it, a traditional license and, and keep it in house. So the demo here is actually two scenarios. I'm going to try to build a model uh, using NIME and R, and, uh, and then I'll deploy those models into ADAPA on the Amazon Cloud. And maybe if you're interested, I can also deploy inside the data mirror Hadoop scenario and, and see how we can. Uh, but the idea is really to show you how simple it is to deploy a model, right? I'm going to create a model in R, and I'm going to, I don't need to do anything. Then I will just export as PML and upload into deployment, deployment engine, which actually is supposedly living in your production environment, right? So you don't need this, this talk between predicting and Jira really becomes really simple. Okay, so let's see. So here's R here, and I'm gonna cheat because it's a demo and I don't wanna, um, so we have a support site, it's like a help desk, and I, you know, we have lots of forums, and there is a lot of forums about supporting PML in R, and I have one that's here, how to build a decision tree using R, 
and exporting as PMML. So if you know, I'm, I'm quite sure some of you are familiar with R and um, a lot of you are probably not, but uh, you just invoke libraries that you're going to use. So we're going to use the XML library, uh, the R part, which is the uh, uh, algorithm that will build our decision tree, and uh, the PML package. And then I'm going to use the audit data set. Actually, maybe I should use, uh, show you the audit data set first. That will make it more interesting. So here I have. So the audit data, data set is actually a text, text audit uh, records. And uh, we want a predictive model to actually choose the records we think should be adjusted. So it's a mean predictive model. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're going to train this data with, uh, and it has tags uh, then here. Who needs to be adjusted and who doesn't? Um, so one meaning you have to adjust your text, you know, returns, and uh, zero, no. So uh, we're going to train our predictive uh, model to do that for us. So once it looks at text records from other people, it will actually tell right away if they need to be adjusted or not, right? <laughs> it's a nice predictive model. I'm sure the RS use something like this, so I, you know I think it's a very good application. So I'm going to use this data, which I'm reading from uh, Togaware in Australia, and uh, you can see here it's so the data is live on the Togaware web website. And Togaware is a company that uh, created the PMML package for R. And then I'm going to save that, uh, uh, and the save XML here actually passes the uh, the R part object in R to the PMML package and saves the PML file as an XML file, okay? So uh, I'm just gonna copy this. So that's the cheating part. And I'm gonna paste into our... So it's doing that all automatically. It's that fast, right? It read my data, the audit data, and uh, it created my decision tree and saved the decision tree as a PML. I have very few, I have 2,000 records. Yeah, no, this is for a demo, so. Uh, <laughs> so let's, let's take a look at that model. Let's see if I can find it here. It's the audit tree XML, right? So it was just created. Oops, that's the one I'm gonna use, opening nine. That's the fish plant and that's the audit tree XML. So here's a model. Um, it says application name Rattle PMML, and uh, it exports version 3.2, which is okay because our engine will have the converter will convert this automatically to for uh, the latest. And then you have all your raw data here, uh, the kind of employment, the education, and all that. That's all represented in PMML. And uh, the tree model that tells me is a classification using the R part algorithm. And the output fields, I'm going to have the probabilities for uh, the adjusted, uh, if your text needs to be adjusted or not. And then the model itself and all the nodes of the decision tree here. So, okay. Um, so that was our modeling R. And let's see if I can show you NIME, because I think you may be interested. So this is NIME. You can download, you can go to NIME.org and download it. I was creating like different um, NIME workflows and it can be very complex, but I created one that's quite simple. Um, you know, if you're building a model, of course, you probably want to do more. So I, you know, this works, it's a very graphical interface. Um, uh, you can talk to R as well. So you have R nodes in here. So I, I use the, you know, I just dragged, like you can drag things like this and put in the interface. So I dragged a CSV reader and it's reading the audit data for, from here. And uh, you know, I don't need to reset. And there is a column filter. I'm telling it uh, to ignore some of those data fields. Uh, you don't want uh, the ignore accounts, the account number as part of your model. You know, that's like one of the first practices of data scientists to ignore these fields, right? And then risk adjustment, it's something that you want to ignore. And you want to use all the other ones. So. So as you can see, it's a very graphical way to represent your models. And then I have a number tree string, and then I have a learner, and that's a decision tree. This actually implements C45, not our part, okay? And then you have a PML writer. And it has these ports, the blue ports are actually PMML ports. So you can, uh, you know, whenever there's a blue port, you can pass the PMML into your PML file. 
and that's the PML writer. And then you can just execute this and you get a PML file out of your uh, PML learner uh, node over here. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, NIME has all kinds of uh, e from the ETL uh, things that you can do. Yes. And you can even do web services in NIME and all that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I executed this already, so it's not going to allow me to execute it until I change something. Let's see, I reset. And then let's see, execute. I can't execute now. Anyway, I created a file before, you believe me. It's this audit3nime.xml. And it just says application name nime, and it has all the fields. So it's, as you can see, it's, once you know PML from R or nime, they all look the same, right? I mean, we have a data dictionary and the same kind of inputs, and we have also decision tree and a mining schema. So that's really the power you know, of open standard. All these tools are generating the same, the same file at the end of the day, you know, a very similar file that you, if you understand one, you understand all of the other ones. So, um, now let me upload that into our scoring engine. Let me find it here. Um, so I have uh, Adapa here, which is our scoring engine for real time, uh, running on the Amazon cloud. And it's, this is actually free trial. It's available on our website. You can register for it and upload PML files. Um, there is, Adapa comes with rule sets and reports. These are not available in the free trial, but um, you know the predictive models are. So you can upload any kind of PML file in there. And uh, I uploaded quite a few models before, a C5 churn model, uh, multinomial logistic model, radio basis, uh, logistic regression, I built in NIME, and a uh, two-step cluster I built on using SPSS, okay? Uh, but let's go ahead and upload, uh, uh, it logged me out, so. Can you see? Okay, good. So let me log in here, and this is the interface for the free trial. I knew something was not gonna, let me just delete this. Okay, I hope it did. Okay, so upload PML file. So let's say I, I build that model in R, right? And this is really the predictor to engineer part, right? The, uh, this, uh, this engine is actually sitting in a production environment. And I'm just gonna move that model from my scientist desktop into my production environment. And that would take, you know, seconds. So. I just click add file, and uh, well, there's a fish plant there. Let me upload that first. And upload it. And I, I forgot to tell you, the fish plant I showed you had a, an error. So Adapter say, ooh, there is a warning here, and you can actually take a look at it. Uh, so try, let's try to, to look at that. So the error here is um, casting error. So when I build this model, I actually had the predicted value, which is a class, as a continuous operational type. So the engine actually complained about it and said, well, I'm gonna do a casting anyway because I'm sure you did it by mistake, okay? So it has this kind of protections. Uh, but that's how it took for me to upload the model into the engine. Now the model lives in there. So if I close, you can see fish plant, and it's ready for me to, to execute, okay? Let me upload the, uh, the one I generated in R. So that went to here. Other three. So it's deployed. There are no errors there. And uh, that's the R part model, the, the bottom one here. Okay. So let's say, well, okay, great. Now I have all this new data that I want to execute for my model. Um, you can do that uh, via web services or you can do that in the console. So let's say if you have batch files that you want to execute, you can say, well, okay, let me select that model. And everything you, I'm doing here, you can do automatically as well. So, and I'll upload my uh, CSV file for scoring. And that was the audit, which was here. I should have selected the other one, but let's see. So there we go, we have uh, the target adjusted, should I adjust you or not, uh, together with the probability. 
Now I could also add some post-processing here in terms of business rules, right? And say, well, I want to create different buckets. And at the end, I really, what I want is a business decision out of this model. That's up to you, OK? So questions so far? It does. Uh, in front, the, in, the, in the free trial, you're not going to see it. But um, if you sign up for the paid version, you have a control center uh, that allows you to select different uh, instance types. So you have uh, extra quadruple, extra large, you know, uh, that you can use. And uh, let's say if you have a lot, a lot of data that you need to score for different models, you can instantiate servers on the fly. So you can have, let's say, well, I have a lot of volume in South America. I'm going to instantiate, create some servers in South America running ADAPA, the scoring engine. And I'm going to upload these models there and score this, this data there. And then you can, once you don't need it, just terminate it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I decided not to show that, uh, not to complicate too much. But thanks for the question, yes. Um, OK, so data mirror. Uh, what I have here is. Uh, Data is that company I told you that has this Excel look and feel kind of spreadsheet idea on top of Hadoop. I actually, uh, we have an Excel adding that you can, uh, and this is great. I mean, we have thousands of people that downloaded the Excel adding. It allows you to score your models from inside Excel, Microsoft Excel. Uh, but I thought, you know, for you, I would probably show the Hadoop, which probably be a little more interesting. But um, the Excel adding uh, from Microsoft allows you to shield uh, the business use of predictive models from the, from the user. So you only need to know in Excel to actually use predictive models that are deployed anywhere. Um, so this is the face of Datamir. And um, you can upload your data and uh, this data then and create jobs and analyze your data on top of Hadoop cluster. You can have hundreds of nodes here. Of course, this is running on my computer, so it's a single node. But um, what I did here is uh, we have a plugin. It's the PML plugin, that's the universal PML plugin, is really uh, the core of a predictive engine running inside Datamir. So it can uh, run on Hadoop. And I uploaded the Iris neural network file, but let me upload that file I just uh, created in R here. And we're getting really to the end of the presentation. So um, that was in here. Let's see. So you see that it has been deployed. Here's our R part model. So it's already ready. You know, I didn't need a year to translate it into Hadoop. You know, I just uploaded directly from R into Hadoop, and I can use it. You know, it's so simple that it kind of like, oh, yeah, uploaded it, right? But that's the idea. So if you want to execute that model now, then you know, I uploaded the, all the data for us here before as a workbook. And um, let's see. I can open that. And here is my audit data inside Data Mirror on top of Hadoop. And uh, I want to score that model. So let me make a copy of this sheet here. And I'm, I'm going to show you something interesting in just a bit. I don't want to that. So here is my data. And then um, Data Mirror offers all these kinds of functions here. And for data scientists, this is great because you can manipulate your Let's say you have terabytes of data. You want to manipulate that data. And this comes to descriptive analytics as well. We want to find out things about uh, you know, what happened in the past. That's what Datamir will do for you. It has all these functions I'm sh showing you here that will allow you to do that. Mathematical functions, statistics, all kinds of things of shopping your data up and all that. Now you want to look forward, then you need PMML, right? And that's where the predictive model comes, comes in, right? So those models that are deployed now are available as functions for you to use inside the Datamir universe and the Hadoop universe. So I want to use the R part model uh, to uh, score my data. So let me just do that real quick. So I select age, and uh, because this inter employment, education, merit. And so think that this is like terabytes of data that I want to pass for my model now. So I build my model usually on a sample of my entire data, right? I don't use the entire data to build it. And I say, OK, this is great. There we go. That's you know for all my millions of tax records, who needs to be adjusted and who doesn't. 
And I can also have the probability in there. I just decided not to show you. So they are running your library actually inside of you? Yes, yes. We call it UP, the Universal PML plugin, okay. uh, to differentiate from Adapa, which is a real time engine. So yeah. Yes, yes, uh, but Datamir takes care of that, yeah. So Datamir is the layer on top of Hadoop and they do all that for us, so. Uh, it was not just running inside the engineer after you extracted data, it was running inside the engineer. Right, correct, correct. Okay, so um, last slide. It's just really resources. Uh, there is a PMML blog that I write mostly. <laughs> So uh, it's, of course, amazing. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's the predictive analytics.info. Uh, um, so check it out. Um, we have the tools I showed you, converter, the transformation generator. They're available uh, through our website. Um, there is a discussion group in LinkedIn. Uh, there is uh, around 3,000 members and uh, lots of interesting discussions there. So feel free to join that. Um, the DMG website of the data mining group has all the specs for all the versions and it has a list of supporters and, and things of that nature. And then for webinars, we have lots of webinars, uh, community forums, white papers, uh, PML examples, lots of them are the tools that you can go to the resource page on the website. And then uh, we also have a book that we published and it's uh, the second edition of the book and I brought a few copies, so sorry. So uh, we're going to be giving that away besides the one that uh, Paul got. Um, and then last but not least, I just want you to, make, to be aware of this. I just finished uh, writing a series of articles for IBM on predictive analytics. And uh, what we talked today is actually the, the, the fourth part there, um, to, uh, put a predictive solution to work. So if you are really curious in finding out all this process of you know, it's starting by looking at data, how to evaluate, build your models, evaluate your models, explain your models, try to sell your models to your, you know, business counterparts. That's all in this uh, four-part series, okay? So I invite you to, to take a look, and I put the, the links in there, and I know Trisha will have it on the website. So I thought of an interesting way to give away. Thank you so much. That, that was it for the talk.